Hi and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now we've been going through Unit 7 of AP World History. In the last video we talked about the causes of World War 1 and in this video we're going to talk about how World War 1 was actually carried on. And this is important because up till this point there had never been a war like this in world history. Never before had a war included as many nations as World War 1 did and never before had a war killed as many soldiers and civilians as World War 1 did. So it was war at a truly epic scale. So let's talk about how it got fought and if you're ready, I'm ready, let's get to it. So as I mentioned in the last video, World War one properly began on July 28th, 1914. And because different nations have been banding together in secret alliances all over the world, when the time came to fight, these two groups of nations readily took their sides. The Allies consisted of Britain, France, Russia, and Italy, and later the United States joined the Allies, and then Russia dropped out to deal with their communist revolution. The Central Powers consisted of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Now, if you had been there on July 28th, and you would ask anybody on the street, how long will this war last, you would have heard a common refrain, it'll be over by Christmas. But, spoiler alert, the war was patently not over by Christmas. In fact, it stretched on for just over four grueling years. Now, why is that? Well, no small part of the extension of the war had to do with the employment of new wartime technology. So let's look at a few of these. First, machine guns. Now, to be fair, machine guns weren't exactly a new technology, but by this time they had been improved upon to such a degree that they were capable of shooting up to 500 rounds a minute. And these guns devastated the ranks of soldiers who found themselves within firing range. So, that's the first reason the war stretched on. Both sides had the devastating capability to deliver lead into the bodies of their enemies at high speed and great quantities. Also in World War I, you saw the advent of chemical warfare. France developed tear gas, which, when fired at the enemy, made their eyes water uncontrollably and also irritated their lungs. Germany developed chlorine gas, which was far more devastating. Chlorine gas, when inhaled and mixed with the water in your lungs, actually turned into hydraulic acid, destroying the lung tissue and often causing an excruciating death. But maybe most significant in the fighting of the war was not a new technology, but a new method method, namely trench warfare. Living and fighting in the trenches was one of the most defining features of combat for most soldiers of World War I. Rainwater filled the trenches, so it was very difficult to stay dry. As a result of that, the flesh on the soldiers' feet would decay and stink worse than a meerkat's armpit. Trust me, if you haven't smelled a meerkat's armpit, it's disgusting. But aside from the spread of disease and discomfort caused by the trenches, this reality led to a long and drawn out war. When both sides are hunkered down facing each other, and when both sides have machine guns pointed at the other trench, there was very little progress that could be made. If one side stormed the other, then that side would just mow them down until they retreated. So a characteristic of this kind of trench warfare was a seemingly endless stalemate. So those are some of the new technologies that made this a completely devastating war. But you should also know that when we talk about World War One, we talk about it as a total Total war. And when we say total war, what we mean is that all the countries that are involved leveraged every one of their resources, both military and domestic, in order to win the war. So for example, factories were converted to churning out war materials. Women went to work in those factories because the men were off fighting. Food was rationed among the population. Media was censored against those who sought to undermine the war effort. So all that to say, the whole population bore the burden of winning the war. Now if that's the case, how was it that these governments kept the people energized in order to keep sacrificing for the greater good? Did they get of speeches appealing to people's rational natures? Now listen, nobody wants to be in this war, but we have got ourselves into it, and if we care to win it, here are the things that we must do. You're right. No, they appeal to people's fears and biases by publishing buttloads of propaganda. Now, propaganda is just any form of media that seeks to influence people's opinions based on exaggerations and misinformation. So, to keep people motivated to sacrifice for the war, people during that time saw posters and articles which depicted the enemy as monsters, and in some cases, exaggerated the danger which threatened the home population. So, the war ground on, and it was truly a global war. Now, one glaring omission from the list of belligerents was the United States. Now, if you know anything about U.S. history, you know that the Americans had a long-standing policy of isolationism from European conflicts. However, there were a few events that made it impossible for the United States to remain uninvolved. First was the German policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. German U-boats made it their policy to sink any ship that came within their territory. And the kicker is that they sunk both military ships and civilian ships. And when the Germans sank a passenger ship called the Lusitania, which ended up killing over 100 U.S. citizens, that got the fires of revenge stoked against the Germans. But the U.S. still did not not enter the war. It was actually something called the Zimmerman Telegram that got the U.S. finally involved in the war. This was a note sent from the German government to the Mexican government, essentially inviting Mexico to start a war with the United States. And why would they do that? Well, Germany could see that they were tempting the U.S. to enter the war against them. And Germany could also see that for the U.S. to enter the war on the side of the Allies would almost surely mean German defeat. But if the Americans were embroiled in a war in Mexico, then maybe they couldn't get involved in the war in Europe. And why would Mexico do such a thing? Well, the Germans promised 
the Mexicans that they would help them get back some of the territory that they lost to America in the Mexican-American War. And the thing is, from the German perspective, this seemed like a decent strategy. But as it turns out, the Americans intercepted that telegram, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back, and then spit upon that broken camel's body, and then insulted its mother. And so the United States entered World War I, and because of their fantastic industrial capacity, and because their homeland had been relatively untouched by the war, they helped turn the tide of the war for the Allies. But the United States was really the only glaring omission from the list of folks who were fighting this war. As I mentioned before, this was a global war. Battles were fought in Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East. Battles were fought in the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And one of the main reasons why the scope of this thing was so large is because of the four centuries of colonial activity that preceded it. Now, I mentioned in the last video that competitions for colonial holdings caused bitter rivalries between these colonial powers, and that was a main cause of the war. But here's where I tell you that the desire for colonial holdings also kept the war going. For example, Japan entered the war on the side of the Allies because they were interested in claiming some colonial territory that belonged to the Germans in the Pacific Islands. Also, the colonial nations fighting this war padded their ranks with colonial soldiers. Parent countries called up troops from their colonial holdings all over the world. For example, Africans and Indians and Australians all found themselves fighting for Britain. West Africans and the Indo-Chinese joined the ranks of the French. And why would they do that? Well, many of these colonial soldiers fought for their imperial country gladly because in many cases the imperial countries promised that such a service would earn them freedom and self-rule. And I probably don't even have to tell you whether or not they kept those promises, but you know, We'll deal with that in another video. Anyway, as I said, the war ground on for just over four years, and in the end, the Allies won the day. And in 1918, they called for the Paris Peace Conference, at which they would draw up a treaty to end the war. In attendance were the big four, the United States, Britain, France, and Italy. Now, astute observers will no doubt notice that I did not mention Russia. That's because Russia was not invited. They actually dropped out of the war about halfway through to have themselves a communist revolution. And now that the Bolsheviks were in power in Russia, and they were refusing to honor their debts to the Allied powers, the Allies, in turn, refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Bolshevik government. Now, at the peace conference, there was a profound ideological division between how peace would be established. American President Woodrow Wilson argued that no one should be overly rewarded for victory and no one should be overly punished for defeat. On the other hand, French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau disagreed. Because France and the rest of the Allies had suffered greatly in the war, he believed the losing powers, especially Germany, should be punished. And ultimately, it was this desire for retribution that won the day. And so it was that the Treaty of Versailles Versailles officially ended the war. One important provision was that the Austria-Hungarian and the Ottoman empires were broken up and new states were established in their place. States like Finland and Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. But maybe more important were the provisions for punishment contained in the treaty. First, the treaty required Germans to pay reparations for the damages done during the war. And this would amount to billions of dollars owed to other countries. Second, the war guilt clause placed the entire blame for the war on on Germany. Well, I'm sure the German people will be okay with that and not get resentful toward the Weimar Republic for accepting such terms and thereby open the door to the rise of the Nazi party who will then start another world war. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, not right, but thank you for watching. If you need help getting an A in your class and a 5 in your exam, click right here and get a view packet, which will blow your mind. And if you're watching but not yet subscribed, then click the subscribe button and come along. Join the Heimler family. Heimler out.